Alright you guys, Dane here and welcome to my December reading wrap up. So these are all the books that I read in the month of December. As always I sort of film these as I go along to try and keep them nice and fresh in my memory. I have a few books to talk to you about today so let's go ahead and get started. So the first one is Dolphin Song by Lawrence and John. I actually did a full review of this as well. Um, and so this is a sort of middle grade book by an author. She has quite a strong uh, focus on like uh, environmentalism and the way we look at the earth uh, and like protecting nature and stuff like that. This is actually the second book in the White Giraffe series but you can read them out of order and in fact I did. And the reason I read this basically is um, Lawrence and John was one of the first authors I spoke to uh, when I set up my book blog socialbookshelves.com and she actually found me and sought me out. And I just think it's really cool because I still see her books every now and then in charity shops. Um, and I don't really see any of the other authors that I spoke to in charity shops. So I just always jump at the, sh the chance when I can to pick up her books. Uh, you can tell this is like aimed really at like probably like 11 year old girls. But what the hey, I, I channeled my inner 11 year old girl for it. Give it a 3.5 out of 5. I thought it was pretty good. Let me have two Dr. Seuss books. I don't have a huge amount to say about these. But these are Dr. Seuss's sleep book and the Lorax, uh, probably a 4 out of 5 for the Lorax, 3.75 out of 5 for the Sleep Book. Uh, the Sleep Book was pretty cool because it, um, you know, it's designed to be read to children who are getting ready to go to sleep and uh, the rhymes kind of reflected that and I thought it worked pretty well. And then I read The Clocks by Agatha Christie, again another full review uh, of this so uh, you feel free to check that out. I gave it a 3.75 out of 5, I thought it was pretty good but it was also like a fairly standard Agatha Christie novel really. Um, yeah, it's uh, the penultimate one that I have that's unread so now the only one that I have in fact, I don't know which one it is, but I have one remaining Agatha Christie book left to read. Which I'll probably aim to read before Christmas, so uh, watch your space for that. But yeah, pretty good. Not the best place to start, but definitely one that you'll want to read if you're a completionist like I am. 3.75 out of 5. Okay guys, just the one book to update you on today, and that's Creative Mischief by Dave Trott. This is non-fiction. Dave Trott is like an advertising guy. He's very funny, but also he uh, has some interesting approaches to like thinking. Uh, so he has, his other books I think are called um, Predatory Thinking was one of them, that's the one. Um, he tells his stories as well to get his point across and uh, he has a very unique writing style and I think the best way for me to do that is to share this example which I really liked which is right at the start of the book and I think I've actually come across this before but he says When I worked at BMP the head of television commuted in from Brighton every day. He started reading The Exorcist on the train. He said he thought it was the most evil book he'd ever read. In fact, he said it was so evil, he couldn't finish it. So, at the weekend, he went to the end of Brighton Pier and threw it as far as he could. So I went to the bookshop. I bought another copy. Then I ran it under the tap and left it in his desk drawer for him to find. Overall, very amusing. I've read, I think, all of Dave Trott's other books now as well. I would give this one... I'll probably go ahead and give it a 4.5 out of 5. There's not very much to fault it for. Uh, I did enjoy it and I would recommend. Alright guys, just the one book to update you on today, and that is William Shakespeare's The Jedi Doth Return by Ian Dershire. This is a Shakespearean take on the third of the original Star Wars trilogy. Return of the Jedi was always my favourite. I know most people tend to uh, prefer Empire Strikes Back, but for whatever reason, Return of the Jedi was always my jam. So I did enjoy this. I mean, I've now read the original Star Wars trilogy in this style, and uh, always good for a laugh, and it's always interesting as well to compare you know, the Shakespearean versions with the original lines. Plus there's some other cool stuff in this. Yoda speaks in haiku. Uh, we have like characters performing sides where they turn and address the audience, which gives them an opportunity to say stuff they wouldn't have been able to say in the original movies. Darth Vader has a conversation with Luke about his lightsaber being green and how that reflects that he's green with, uh, you know, naivety when he believes that Vader's going to turn from the dark side of the force. Overall, it's a lot of fun, especially if you're a fan of either Star Wars or Shakespeare. I gave this one a 4 out of 5. Alright, just the one book to wrap up for you today, and that is It Came From Ohio, My Life as a Writer by R.L. Stein. I think what's good about this is that Stein's had a bunch of different kind of audiences throughout his life, and he writes in such a way that it was engaging for me to read it as a 31-year-old dude, you know? Um, but you could also read it as like a 13-year-old kid, and you would also enjoy it. There's a lot of like examples of his earlier work when he used to make his own little kind of fanzine style things. You get to learn all about, you know, Fear Street and then later on Goosebumps. I actually didn't know they were in that order. Um, and you hear all kinds of just the stories from his childhood that inspired him. You can kind of see, his, kind of see how a lot of them then became Goosebumps stories. 
Um, and also, I guess it's just interesting to see what like literary and publishing was like in like the 60s and 70s, and moving, you know, I guess closer to the 90s and and noughties. Uh, because before he was a novelist, he was working a lot in newspapers and magazines and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, yeah, lots of cool stuff. As you can see, I've tabbed it out to do a full review, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Overall, I gave it a 4 out of 5. Wow. Alright guys, just the one book to wrap up for you today, and that is The Currents of Space by Isaac Asimov. Uh, this book is interesting uh, because, I mean, it's kind of more of an espionage thriller almost, like a political thriller than a sci-fi novel, although there are definitely sci-fi elements. Uh, we follow a guy who's been subjected to like a mind probe and because of this mind probe um, he's kind of lost a lot of his memory and that kind of stuff so it's kind of it's interesting I mean it does do that whole trope of a main character doesn't remember something important we slowly learn what it is with him um, but I guess it's a reasonably early example of that overall that I wouldn't say it's particularly memorable um, it's not the best Asimov that's for sure although obviously even any Asimov is worth checking out but um I gave this one a, I gave it a 3 out of 5, it just wasn't, wasn't all that. Hello everybody, Greedy Swallow is here, we've just decided that's my porn nickname. And, because um, that's how I drink coffee, just in case you're wondering, and jizz. Uh, so, I have two books to update you on. Uh, the first one is this one which I read last night, Petit Manuel pour Alice sur le Pop by Paul Bateau and Nanook Ricard. Uh, this is a, a manual to teach little children how to shit, so I will give you a sample sentence and translation. Oh, here we go, let's do this bit. Quand tu as envie de faire pipi ou caca, vide, dis-le à maman ou à papa ou au deux. So that's, uh, when you feel like you're going to go pee pee or caca, quickly say so to mom or dad, or both. Tu dois te retenir jusqu'à... Uh, Jusqu'à ce que tu sois enfant à six, uh, si tu fais pipi ou caca dans le pot, tes parents seront très très contents. And that's advanced French, that's got uh, future tense in it, and uh, conditional as well. So if you make pipi ou caca in the potty, uh, your parents will be very very happy. Yeah, so um, I gave this a 4 out of 5 because until I read this I didn't know how to shit. Um, but now I know everything I need to know. 33 and a third Black Sabbath Master of Reality, or just Master of Reality by John Darnell. Uh, this is published by Bloomsbury, although to me it looks kind of self-published. Uh, there's a whole series of these, like 150, 135, uh, and I've heard of a lot of the albums, but not necessarily any of the writers that have, uh, like, written in this series. So! I've read a few more books, uh, they're mostly French books, uh, which I've been reading as my bedtime reads. So, we have the Concombre contre le Grand Potato Sir. This is the cucumber against the great potato. -er. It's not really a, it's not really a French word, so there's not really an English translation for it. But basically, it's this sort of surreal, magical tale about this cucumber that um, goes against this guy who has like a potato machine, turning things into potatoes and then fries. So he has to like, there's a radish involved. Uh, so I learned the French for radish is radis. Oh, Raddy, sorry, you silent S. And uh, I also learned that I uh, Brussels sprout is un chou rave. So I learned some new dialogue. Overall, I did enjoy it. It was very mad, which is uh, always a good thing from your French BDs. Uh, there's one of the... Um, well, he turned... I don't, I don't want to tell you, actually. I don't want to spoil it for you. Overall, though, I did enjoy it. I gave it a 4 out of 5. Then we have An Anlotum by Charlotte Ferrero. Um, this only has this very intro bit here, which says, Parapluie au ver, uh, which says, Parapluie au ver, le vent s'amuse beaucoup, les champignons aussi. Uh, which means, umbrellas open, the wind will entertain you a lot, and so will the mushrooms. And it's literally this. So it's, uh, you know, there's no other words to it. So I was a little bit disappointed, because that's kind of why I wanted to read it, was to improve my French. Uh, comprehension and whatnot. Uh, oh no, I can't get it to go away now. Here we go. I said that it is a beautiful little artifact. Uh, I'll give it a three out of five. It was all right. And then I read Le Chat Star by Nicolas Vial, and uh, this is about a cat that becomes a film star. But what's interesting is there's almost like a BoJack Horseman vibe to it, where um, we kind of see what happens after she hits the peak of her fame and things are on like the downward spiral for her. Uh, kind of quite complex French, more um, like paragraphs and stuff. Um, 
and like 80, 90 pages or so. Uh, but I enjoyed it, it was good. I quite like the illustration style and it was also a bonus that I read this with uh, Biggie curled up around my feet as well. So overall I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Which brings us on to A Daughter's A Daughter by Agatha Christie. This is one of the books that she wrote under her pseudonym of Mary Westmacott. I've heard these described as romance novels, but this is definitely more like a contemporary vibe to it. Like contemporary for 1940 or whatever. Um, so, uh, and yeah, although there isn't like murder and stuff or Miss Markle and Poirot popping in to say hello or like Ariadne Oliver or anything like that. Uh, what I really like about Christie's work is like her view of the world and the way that characters kind of reflect a lot of the societal concerns at the time. So this is all about, um, basically this guy wants to marry this woman, but she has a daughter who's like very possessive of her. And so she kind of has to choose between him and the daughter and then we kind of follow the aftermath of that. So plot wise, not really something I'm too interested in, but it had a lot of like sort of Christie philosophy in there. Like with lines like, uh, what was it? It was, uh, there's, no, there's no privacy in a flat. Even the plumbing isn't secret or something like that, which is just twisted my melon. So overall, 3.5 out of 5, I would only recommend it really if you're a hardcore Christie fan and you want to like read everything she ever did. But I am, um, I fit that bill. I think Mara from books like Woe would enjoy it, for example, as a Christie fan. So I'd recommend that to her on the off chance she's watching. Okay, so I don't know how this has happened, but a bunch of my wrap-up footage has just totally gone missing. So I am hoping that I'll be able to find all of that. Uh, but if not, towards the end of this month, we might have some footage of me going back over the books I've missed. Uh, I do have one book to wrap up for you today, and that is Planet News by Allen Ginsberg. This is a poetry collection. I started tabbing it out as though I was going to do a review for it, and then quickly realised that I just didn't have enough to say about it. I think maybe I'm getting a bit too old for Ginsberg. It does have Television Was a Baby Crawling Toward That Death Chamber in here, which is a poem I do quite like. But as for the rest of the poetry, it was kind of forgettable. I mean, it's typical Ginsberg, but it just didn't feel as though there was anything new and nothing really stuck with me from it, so I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Alright, hello, it's me, and uh, I have a book to wrap up for you today. That is A Happy Death by Albert Camus. Uh, this is almost like a precursor to The Outsider, which is another one of his novels. It's one of his earlier works, uh, and it basically follows a guy who kills somebody and then how he sort of evades justice, uh, but also it looks a lot like philosophy. It's one of those books where the plot's kind of slow-paced, but it keeps on asking you questions as the reader and so it kind of keeps you going through till the end and uh, you feel smarter by reading it. Uh, I did enjoy it, I thought a lot and uh, I'm looking forward to reading more Camus. So I gave this one a 4 out of 5. So that brings me to this little section here where basically for whatever reason a bunch of my wrap up footage has gone missing so I need to tell you about a bunch of books. So we have Mustache of Pappy. Uh, which was a French BD, a band dessinaire, and um, it was basically a very short little book where um, you could get like little tiny toy moustaches basically and you put them on the different feet characters and you learned how to say different types of moustache like, you know, a moustache long, a long moustache and all that kind of stuff. So that was a 3.5 out of 5, it was kind of made by this gimmick of the moustaches in there to be honest. Then there was the Early Asimov, Volume 3 by Isaac Asimov. I did a full review of this. Uh, basically, my problem with this one is that with the Early Asimov, it was originally published as a hardback, but uh, it was also published in paperbacks as Volume 1, 2, and 3. And by Volume 3, it's not really Early Asimov anymore. So he kind of writes about um, the stories themselves and does like little introductory essays, which are fascinating, and they talk about how the stories came about. But then he's saying, you know, like, oh, I wrote this one in between writing these two, like, super influential ones he wrote. And that just kind of left me feeling like I'd rather be reading the super influential ones. Having said that, I do want to work my way through all of Asimov's stuff eventually. And it was alright, I would give it a 3.5 out of 5. Then we have The Mysterious Mr. Quinn by Agatha Christie. So this was just me ticking off the rest of the unread Agatha Christie books that I haven't got to yet. Uh, I always thought this one was interesting because uh, Colin Dexter has a book called The Silent World of Nicholas Quinn and Colin Dexter created Inspector Morse so I wondered whether he got the Quinn from that from Agatha Christie. Uh, this is Harley Quinn so it's one of her like lesser known detectives but um, yeah it was okay. At this point I don't really remember it too much um, but I, I think at the time I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Okay, then we have Princess Astro. This is another French graphic novel, a band dessinaire. This is about a character called Astro who lives in space 
and her mum gets her a pet basically and then the pet kind of escapes and because she's a princess she's not really allowed out to like you know just go knocking around space and stuff but she goes to kind of reclaim her pet and this takes her on this adventure and it takes her outside her comfort zone and it took me outside my comfort zone because it was helping me to learn French uh, I thought it was quite an intriguing little story as well uh, probably a 4 out of 5 for that then we have The Complacent Lover by Graham Greene I don't really remember reading this one too much was it a play? I think it was a play Yes, it was a play, uh, and it was kind of about a love triangle, so I'm not generally that interested in that, but Green did it well. Um, I do enjoy Graham Green; it's one of my favourite authors, and again, he's one who I'm just ticking off the last few books for. I do think The Complacent Lover, I would have enjoyed seeing it more as a play, uh, especially because see, uh, Act 2, I think, or uh, yeah, I think it was Act 2, is set in Amsterdam, which is one of my favourite cities, um, and I would have liked to have seen how they'd have you know brought that to life on the stage overall some great like wisdom in there one-liners uh the story itself maybe not something i'm as interested in as much but i am still glad i read it and i gave it eight four out of five then we have the myth of sisyphus by albert camus i did a dedicated review of this one as well um this is basically a, a non-fiction book in which camus investigates absurdity and tries to find meaning in an absurd life so if you accept the absurdity of life like it's all just random, there is no meaning to life. There are only certain things you can do, and one of them is to commit suicide. Um, but one of them is to find meaning in art, through, for example. And he uses the tale of Sisyphus, who is, uh, I want to say he was ancient Greek dude, who had to, he was condemned to keep pushing a, a rock, a boulder up a hill every day, and he'd push it up to the top, and then the next day he'd have to start again and push it back up to the top. And uh, Camus kind of, I guess, compares that to the mundane lives that we le live today, you know, where you go to work, you come home, you go to bed, you go to work, you come home, you go to bed. And uh, he looks at the different ways we can try and find meaning. I thought it was really fascinating. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. Then we have Cease Received by Sylvain Vector. This is a, another French BD and uh, the Cease Received is like six titles, so it kind of takes its uh, inspiration from music and um, yeah, it's like six individual pieces, but they all kind of come together to form like part of a whole theme. So it's really interesting to see that like juxtaposition of how music works with um, how, you know, literature and graphic novels in particular work. Um, it was a little more advanced, so it was quite often difficult for me to go from one story to the next because I'm, you know, I'm having to pick up again what's going on. Um, I guess when you're reading a graphic novel in your own language, You've got the visual clues, but also it's much easier to read the text. Whereas for me, I was like over focusing on the text to understand that. So at times I missed parts of the visuals and kind of struggled to know what was going on. Overall though, pretty good and I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Then I read Tamara to de Passe by Doras Isidru. This is another French band dessinaire and this is uh, all about a character called Tamara. She's kind of a little bit overweight, she's unpopular, kind of nerdy. She also has a very short temper as well, but she's one of those characters who's really interesting to read about. She feels very relatable, this kind of epitome of teen angst almost. Um, like so it's I think it was originally published uh, like in a newspaper or something like that and this is just a collection and it's actually only one of like 12 collections so I want to read more of them because I did really enjoy the way they were done but that means like every what two three pages in it is like a full strip and then you move on to another one so again that can be kind of jarring because you're just getting your head around what's actually going on and then you move to another one and you have to pick it back up again which isn't easy when you're um, not reading in your your native language but there is some cool stuff in there like uh, there was one where she went to a beauty salon to get an artificial spot put on her face because the trend was to have spots and then by the time she gets out the trends disappeared again and um yeah, lots of cool stuff like that. I give it a 4 out of 5 and would recommend for sure. Alright, next up we have The Case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft. This is like one of his earlier novels, maybe a novella arguably. Still a lot of fun, a uh, little bit outdated in terms, in terms of the language. I mean, Lovecraft was notoriously not a particularly nice person. But the man could write. Uh, he's not my favourite. I did enjoy reading The Case of Charles Dexter Award. I mean, it felt like somebody imitating Frankenstein, to be honest. Um, but I like to read Lovecraft just, I guess, to see where a lot of the inspiration comes from writers like Stephen King and some of the other writers I really admire. So overall, I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Then there was Accidental Death of an Anarchist by Dario Fo. So this is kind of an absurd, uh, zany comedy. It's a play. The translation I had was translated by, I think, called Simon Nye. And uh, I picked this up from Wickham Arts Centre because they'd actually put a stage play on of it 
but I, they'd hosted it a couple of uh, years ago and they still had some copies lying around so I thought hey I'll take that as the excuse I need to finally pick it up and read it. It was a little bit weird because there were like references to things like the Iraq war and it's like but this was first released in like 1970 or something. So um, I, I don't know how much the translator actually played around with the original to make it work, but um, I still enjoyed reading it. I'd give it a four out of five and would go and see the play of it. Then we have Le Chasse Star by Nicolas Viala. So this is another French BD. Uh, this is about a cat that becomes a movie star. And what's interesting is actually we follow like their fall from grace afterwards. So we follow them like before they're really well known, then at the height of their fame, and then again afterwards. And because of that, it just adds this extra little dimension to it, you know. So, um, yeah, I think it was a really decent little read and would definitely recommend it if you're like, looking to learn some French. Then we have Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. Uh, this was a gift from Susie as like an early Christmas present and I kind of read it as a, as a buddy read with Charlie. Although I think we both just read it at the same time. We didn't really discuss it. So I still need to see what he thought of it. I thought it was beautiful, really well written. Uh, it's kind of like a literary fiction murder mystery but with weirdness thrown in. Uh, there was a big twist at the end, which I did see coming, but I don't think it really matters too much, and it kind of goes quite well with the theme of the book. Overall, I gave it 4.5 out of 5, and I did a full review of it as well. And then finally we have Bed by Tao Lin. So Tao Lin is one of those writers, every time I read his books, I tend to get a backlash online, like people just assume I'm a bad person because I'm reading Tao Lin, and I don't know why, but I also don't really want to look into why, because I like reading Tao Lin, so I kind of don't want to ruin it. Bed is a collection of his short stories, it's um, very like quirky, it's almost like magical realism in a way, except not really, but it does do that thing of like tackling the mundane aspects of life, and um, yeah, he has like again this kind of quiet philosophy going on throughout it, and uh, Bed is actually linked together, a lot of the stories are like looking at the ideas of love as a cryptid, so love as the Loch Ness Monster, so it actually has the Loch Ness Monster on its cover. So that is me all caught up and uh, that is it for my December 2020 reading wrap up. So uh, I will be back soon with my top books of the quarter and then my top books of 2020 and also obviously January 2021 is uh, looming ahead of us. So as always thanks a lot for watching, don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so what you thought of them. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.